It's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Derek Yock. Trained, uh, done, done medical training in South Africa, trained in public health at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Derek Yock is one of the champions for global health. He's, he's done a great deal of research, written a great number of papers and books on the issue of global health and the, the spread of global disease. <coughs> Excuse me. He has special expertise in the worldwide spread of chronic disease as opposed to infectious disease. When he was in South Africa, he established the Center for Epidemiologic Research at the South African Medical Research Council. He then came to the United States, well actually not to the United States directly, he spent time in Geneva at the World Health Organization in a very influential position. And in that, oh, excuse me, <coughs> he deserves a more coherent introduction. Um, in that position, he was responsible for a worldwide framework convention on tobacco control and was also instrumental in a framework convention for diet, physical activity, and nutrition, and reported directly to the Director General of the WHO. He then came to Yale University, where he was on the faculty of the School of Public Health. He went from here to the Rockefeller Foundation, and then joined the PepsiCo Corporation as Director of Global Health Policy. And in that position, has had a major influence on the way a large corporation thinks about these these diet and nutrition issues. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Derek Yock. Well, thanks, Kelly, and it's a real um, pleasure and uh, opportunity to have a chance to talk to you today. Um, and um, just to say that uh, you saw some of the op-eds. Um, I'm pleased to say that um, one of the op-eds, the, the one that you saw written in 2004 by Kelly and um, Marion Nessel, uh, was timed fairly carefully and coherently to actually happen exactly while the World Health Organization was struggling against mainly the sugar industry to get through uh, dietary guidelines on a worldwide basis. And um, that editorial coming out literally in the week of the discussion at the World Health Assembly uh, had a very important impact because it went straight into the hands of uh, the ministers of health of every country of the world. Um, and I think not just writing an op-ed putting it in the right place, but the, the importance of timing is also something really important to think about. Well, I'm sure you're probably uh, intrigued to know what is somebody with a medical and public health degree possibly doing at PepsiCo? And um, how could we possibly be taking that um, list of brands that you saw earlier um, and turning it into something that is healthier? Well, I think what I hope to do is to give you an inside look um, not into the general arguments, but into the specific ways that we are thinking about research and development and how we see research and development as the key to transforming the company. In the end, we certainly can and will continue to do a lot to stop marketing to kids. We need to and we will continue to try and change labeling to make it more effective. Um, we can do a lot more to promote physical activity. We can do a lot more to promote health education. All of that is true. But the, the proof of whether we really are a transformative company rests on the nature of our products. Their content, the portion size, their functional benefit, or the harms that they could cause. And that, I would say, is, is the central reason why this new entity called Global R&D at PepsiCo has been formed. It's only been in effect for a few months. Um, we have, for the first time, a chief scientific officer um, who, like me, comes from a medical background, uh, born in Pakistan, uh, trained in England, a few years at the Mayo <coughs> Clinic, um, where he was uh, involved in um, heading endocrinology and metabolic um, research, and then headed Takeda Pharmaceuticals Worldwide R&D for a number of years um, before coming to uh, PepsiCo. So you have interesting people with backgrounds, uh, in his case, uh, treating and preventing diabetes, uh, now our colleagues accusing him of causing diabetes, um, and myself the same on the obesity side. We believe, as I said, that R&D is really where performance meets purpose um, and why we start nourishing our minds and bodies of consumers. 
Over the last few years, there have been a number of scenarios of what, what are we likely to expect in terms of the food, food industry. And we looked at these carefully while we started developing our own scenarios. Um, the first is really that we're going to continue to have an extrapolation of the trends, rising food prices, hardship, commerce and agriculture respond, food choices become healthier, evidence-based medicine uh, starts influencing our dietary patterns. That's one possible scenario. A second one is the challenge of hard times, and we might say that these scenarios were developed before the start of the economic recession that we're moving into. Even more dramatic rising food prices, uh, <laughs> oil prices, water scarcity, <coughs> riots, failed states, recurring results, healthy eating becomes costly, which in fact it is, diet-related problems worsen, uninsured, un the unsustainable health care costs continue to rise, calamity, disaster, and so on. Or a future that works for all. Instead of um, simple status quo or the grim reality, one where we try and manage and predict the future and actually advance a sustainable future where um, sustainable agriculture, the environment, health, water, are all seen as needing attention simultaneously. We are opting to um, bet on scenario three, not just bet on it, but to be involved in trying to create it. The reality we know is we face massive public health challenges. And to look at three starkly, we face a massive problem of undernutrition on a worldwide basis. 850 million people hungry literally in the last year and a half because of the food price crisis, 100 million people being pushed into food crisis. And remember for these, these people, particularly the under twos, we're talking about permanent intelligence deficits that have both personal, economic, and family implications for the long term. Massive levels of micronutrient deficiency. Overnutrition, I think you all know, a billion people overweight and obese, um, and in countries where you least expect it, in a country like South Africa, my own country, about 20% of children are stunted, but 50% of women between the ages of 15 and 30 are overweight or obese. So you have stunting and obesity occurring in the same setting. And we could talk about that later. The massive costs for worker productivity are occurring. Worldwide, we're seeing the, the, the impacts of aging, <coughs> which we shouldn't regard as a downside, but as a fantastic success of public health and development. But the reality is that as people grow older, there are certain nutrition challenges they face: muscle mass loss, and cognitive function being two that any of you would appreciate if you have um, older parents and grandparents. Well, you might see those as challenges or you might see them as opportunities. Opportunities both for business and for public health. And we're trying to build the case for turning them around and rather seeing the opportunistic side. Um, in terms of undernutrition, we would argue that uh, we have a massive consumer base who, while they may not be able to afford premium products, need uh, high-quality, nutritious food even more than people in their higher social classes. How can we as a company engage and develop products in that area? In the overweight and obesity area, we're facing all the challenges which we'll go into later around how we might reduce salt, sugar, and fat, and portion sizes in a systematic way and enhance functionality. And in the boomer category, we see that there are opportunities, but there are some threats that we don't want to start making false claims about uh, extended longevity, um, which are not based on science. And of course, if you go to any of the um, supermarkets or you go to the pharmaceutical shelves and the chemists, you'll find a wide range of products out there. Most of them have not been tested uh, for efficacy. In terms of the challenges to the company itself, we face a wide range of, cha of challenges from investors, NGOs, WHO, government, just to give you a sense of them. Um, this, this is the front page of a report for JP Morgan Investment Insights. Uh, the investment community is starting to focus far more, not just on the financial performance on co companies, but on how well are they doing to address major public health problems, environmental sustainability, um, energy use. And in this report, which is pretty damning of ourselves, um, they highlight the fact that 
There are many, uh, there are many aspects of our policies that we haven't focused on. Uh, they highlight the need for affordable nutrition. They highlight the fact that we don't have global marketing codes um, and that we are practicing reasonable practices in one part of the world but not applying them in other parts of the world. Overall, we got ranked seventh out of 10 of the top fo food companies. Now, a report like this um, I find very attractive because I can take that to our CEO and she reacts very seriously to a report like that. Um, she would also react seriously to an op-ed, by the way. Whereas an epidemiological article in an obscure public health journal tends not to attract the same kind of attention, even though it may be built on the same basis. The second is, uh, in many countries, we face direct challenges. Uh, this is the Minister of Health of India. Um, and the Supreme Court of India recently asked the Indian Medical Research Council to carry out a review on the uh, healthful effects or not healthful effects of soft drinks. That started a major debate among the, the beverage companies. How do you respond to that? Do you go into denial? Do you respond positively? Do you think about changing your policies and your practices? Remembering that India is a very important market for us, particularly since our CEO originally comes from Chennai. A different type of threat and challenge is from the NGO community worldwide. This is the Consumer International's Dump Soft Drinks campaign. Obviously, the kind of campaign that uh, doesn't give you a warm and fuzzy feeling if you're sitting inside a soft drink company. How do you respond to that? Again, do you go into a defensive mode? Do you look at the substance of what they're saying? Um, and in discussion, we can talk about how we respond to some of these. And I think one of the most important uh, sets of notes <coughs> recently from uh, Margaret Chan, the head of WHO, was reminding us that food choices are highly sensitive to price. The first items to drop out of the diet are usually the healthy foods. Fatty processed foods are often the cheapest way to fill hungry stomachs. She's talking from a global perspective, but I think any of you who've done any research would know this is true worldwide. Well, what is our response to that? How do we actually do something as a responsible company to turn that around? And again, something I'll come back to. We see very clearly that there's a difference between development and research. Um, development really involves applying current knowledge to a need and creating a new product. That's obviously important, but what is really needed is to expand knowledge to enable new developments. We have tended in R&D to be mainly a D company rather than an R company. And the reason is really quite simple. If you look at most food companies, they tend to be driven by very short-term objectives demanded by Wall Street, as opposed to the pharmaceutical companies, who have a pipeline of research of five to 10 years. If we start telling our uh, finance people that we want uh, money from them to go away for 10 years and we'll give them some solutions, I can tell you they will just walk away after laughing at us. Instead, we need to think about a model that works better for the food industry, where research yields results quicker than the cycle of pharmaceutical companies, but also starts building the case for some of the long-term work. And that's where we are at, the mo at, at present. Just to give you a sense of what is the spending like, um, here's R&D as a percent of net sales for many of the major food companies. And you'll see we're down at the lower end of the list. There are a range of reasons. So we're spending about around 1% of our revenues on R&D. Um, the top leader is Unilever. Again, they tend to have a base uh, um, of different products which also lend themselves to more research intrinsically than us. But aside from that, let's just think about how do you judge this figure? Is 1% is a big figure, a small figure? How do you know? Well, let's look at some other industries. Um, I, I use a, a sensor razor made by Gillette. And uh, I was interested to know, well, how much money does Gillette spend on R&D to get that kind of razor? And they're spending about 3 to 4% of revenues to produce a razor. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry spends about 15 to 18% of revenue on R&D. And the biotech companies and the um, IT companies are spending 18 to 22% to 25% of revenues. So we're at the extreme low end. In fact, we are at the level of the extractive industries or the mining companies. Uh, you know, taking, getting more coal out of a piece of coal or getting more gold out of a, a lump of gold is about where we're at. Um, I mention that because it shows where we are today and it's certainly not where we're going to be tomorrow. How do you grow dramatically from here? Again, is something I'm going to talk about. 
We certainly see that conceptually, as we start doing long-term research, there will have to be a close interaction between product development. <coughs> and as I said, the process will have to be sped up compared to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but our vision is that while we know you have to start with a whole bunch of ideas, and over time you eventually land up having very few that get deployed, um, we need to be doing that in a faster approach and see when we can actually send them off to our business units. It's fine for us to talk about um, a wonderful new product that's going to promote longevity, for example, or muscle mass and strength. But if we don't have a base out there in a business unit, by a business unit I mean one of the companies you saw um, on the screen before, nothing will happen. <coughs> so we've started structuring and uh, developed a new structure which um, looks like this. And hopefully um, over the course of the next year or two, you'll s I'll be able to give you progress in each element. But it shows you what does it take to do R&D within a, a large food company. Remember, this is the first time we've ever taken all the R&D capabilities across all those companies you've seen and tried to mold them into one global unit. And that was only possible with the appointment of a chief scientific officer who sits on the board and the executive. So biological and ingredient research, advancing research, um, understanding um, a wide range of issues, including, for example, um, functional, the functionality of food, sensory perception. Remember, whatever we produce, if it isn't going to taste great, it won't be eated, eaten. There are only a small fraction of people who eat healthy food that tastes like cardboard, very small proportion, as I'm sure you've probably been, been through in your courses. Important for us as well is packaging and processing. And I'm sure you will begin to understand increasingly that there are intimate links between what you can do in terms of processing and packaging. The demand for biodegradability or for recyclability is incredibly high. We can't go and produce uh, products which can't go into packaging that isn't either going to be recycled or biodegradable. So we have a stepped up series of activities around making sure that we have new, new guidelines for what kind of packaging we'll produce now and in future. Increasingly, you'll see packaging that's also bioactive, that it actually, the packaging itself breathe some activity into the product, either maintaining it or protecting it, allowing us to take out any of the unnatural stuff from our products. Of course, all this rests on food safety, and each one I'll come into it in a brief second. We have a strong nutrition group, and with the creation of this new center, our CEO has made it clear that we now control the decision on new product development and new acquisitions, which means that any product about to be acquired or developed has to meet what we regard as the optimal nutrition guidelines before it goes into the development phase. Which means that if a great option for, say, an energy drink with uh, tons of caffeine and uh, guarana and ginseng comes up, which it actually did recently, um, we would judge it and say, well, that's actually not going to do very much to impress you that we're serious about health or the consumer or help our portfolio. Therefore, despite the fact that it may be more profitable than some other things, we should walk away from it. And that's what's happening to a great extent. And then the area that I head, which is health and science and health science and policy, tries to bring a lot of this together. Um, in terms of the, the, uh, the, the nutrition challenge, I think we, we, we try and see this in very simple terms. We try to define what are the, the right nutrients what are the nutrients to limit? So for example, sodium, um, fat, sugar would be up here. Those we want to limit for some reason, usually because excess has health consequences. What do we want to increase? And again, this, this is perhaps one of the toughest areas because in a country like the US, there isn't scurvy, there isn't massive vitamin deficiency, but there are certain unique deficiencies. Fiber is one, vitamin D in younger kids is another, maybe even in older people. Um, there are probably a wide range of others, probably omega-3s are going to become more important as we learn more about brain development and so on. Uh, food groups to increase as an entity, we think that the dairy category as a category, provided you can keep the saturated fat levels low, uh, remain an important area and the whole area of protein remains important. We, for each of these, we will have quantitative estimates of where exactly do we want to go. So for example, where do we want to, what do we want to limit? When we say we want to limit salt, 
What does that mean in terms of the salt content of a packet of crisps or of our oatmeal or of many of our other products? Um, we also want to start defining the question about what are the right occasions. As a company, we basically only own one meal, um, breakfast, where we have oatmeal and Tropicana, and hopefully you all start your day with that. Um, we don't have any other major meals. We have a bunch of snacks. The question is, how can those be redefined in terms of uh, main meals, um, as opposed to simply doing what the marketers would want, seek every pop possible occasion to fill it up with a snack opportunity from early in the morning till late at night till a wake-up call at 2 in the morning to go and get some final snack to make sure you're able to sleep through the night. That's the way uncontrolled marketers would want to work. And we face the challenge of trying to actually make sure that we, don't, that we have some constraint on how that happens. And then the right calories. And we have a, a major focus now on trying to address the issue of what are the right number of calories per serving that carry the right number of nutrients. <coughs> Our long-term research is starting to focus on in two broad areas, uh, physiology and, and the sensory perception. The two, of course, are closely linked. What we're learning um, as we start looking at both the biology and the science is that there's a far more close and intimate link between sensory perception and physiological processes, whether it's metabolic pathways, um, let's say of um, uh, understanding uh, the sugar pathways, both the nutritive and the non-nutritive sweetener pathways, how they react to different type of signals around sensory perception with taste and flavor particularly. We now know, for example, that um, sensory perception occurs not just in the mouth and tongue, but it occurs through the um, upper GI tract. Uh, signals are sent from there to the brain, which have impacts on your feeling of satiety or your desire to eat and not to eat. Well, how do we actually take that knowledge in a way in which is responsible and make sure that food design actually has the desired effect of not encouraging overeating and actually encourages people to be on a healthy path of uh, consumption. Um, our goal is to deliver science-based health and wellness solution that satisfy the minds and bodies of consumers. And I said the word minds is in here for a reason. I think you're all aware that increasingly um, the neuroscience advances are telling us a lot more about the links between what have been seen as isolated metabolic pathways, for example, controlling sugar, and the brain. <coughs> and that is just, it's going to increase. The question we have to ask is, how do you actually use that science in a responsible way, and in a way in which we don't have a response, which many of you would probably uh, raise, um, and that all we're really doing is trying to manipulate the minds of consumers, or try to get into an addictive mode, which is the mode that, of course, the uh, tobacco industry got into. If we actually look at it uh, conceptually, we see that um, when we look at the vision of long-term research, we see that there's also an added element of natural and cultural identity interacting with inherent functional benefit and sensory experience. What does that mean? Well, we see everywhere in the world that there is intrins intrinsic value and understanding about the anthropology of food. So, for example, in India, Ayurvedic medicine, if you go through the Ayurvedic texts, you will find thousands upon thousands of mention of specific foods to be used in certain circumstances to have desired effects, both in terms of the body and the mind. Well, we are actually starting to look at that literature and trying to work with colleagues in India to understand how do we actually use some of that indigenous knowledge, again, in a responsible way. The same we're looking at in the Amazon, the same we're looking at in South Africa, where all around the world you will find that there's indigenous knowledge about food use that is often eroding as we try and uh, uh, blanket the world with a homogenous bunch of food products. Um, here's just a brief example. Um, we know in different parts of the world, in the Mediterranean culture, uh, tomato or tomato and olive oil uh, have been consumed together and have certain bioefficacies. The interesting thing is that the tomato benefits without the olive oil uh, don't, uh, you don't get the efficacy. So the good news is that um, you know, having olive oil on your tomato, and, and having a bit of mozzarella, by the way, will actually have an enhanced effect as opposed to just trying to eat a tomato alone. Now, you would not get that if you took the usual uh, single 
uh, reductionist approach of a scientist and go plant by plant, as opposed to going into the culture to see how combinations of food are consumed. Similarly, there are three spice combinations between ginger and some of the peppers and some of uh, the other spices, which in the Ayurvedic texts will tell you how you should combine classically. This is a dramatic difference from a, an approach to search for specific bioactives and stick them into food, which is what a number of other companies, and we still continue to do. It's also a big difference between a pharmaceutical approach to uh, nutrition as opposed to a food-based approach where you're actually trying to build on the culture and build on the way actually people put their combinations together. So we have a team focusing just on looking at these combinations, trying to understand in different parts of the world how foods are consumed, how we might maximize that, and work with different groups. Um, when we look conceptually at, at all of this, we find that there are a wide range of opportunities for us um, to do almost anything you could dream of. Where do we place our bets? And we're placing them where we know that there's going to be a benefit, a likelihood of success, a sure bet, but we're also looking at some very long shots. And we know that we're at, at, we at this stage, the, in the terms of the state of science, we know that a lot of the product development that we're doing now for the next three months or six months is probably going to be irrelevant five, six, seven years from now. The problem, as I said, as a food company is that it's very difficult to actually motivate your own board to put money into long-term bets. Um, if we look uh, broadly at the, the technology and where we're likely to go in the future, just to give you a snapshot of what we anticipate will start happening, if you look at most of our stuff, we basically have got savory snacks skewed to mostly fried. Long term, well, how can we think beyond frying and some of the grains? Everything is in a shiny plastic bag. You know, we have a ton of stuff in these shiny plastic bags. Well, how do you actually move from that to being authentic and totally green? Um, we have teams focusing on some of these things. In terms of our beverages, um, all the stuff basically comes in lines that can only deliver what is called cold full or hot full. Cold full means basically sterilization can be kept at a minimum. Um, it's how you get um, Pepsi and a wide range of products. The beauty of a hotline is that you can actually uh, sterilize uh, things and have more active products like Tropicana and so on. Well, how do we actually reinvent our processing so we can be more flexible and retrofit them to be more flexible about the kind of products that you'll see in the future? How do we even think about um, the fact that so many of our bottles are generic and there's a large amount of material, both in the plastic. Uh, so we have teams saying, well, how do you actually dramatically reduce the plastic? On the metal side and some of the metallic stuff we're doing, we've even been to the motor vehicle manufacturers to find out what is happening in, on the cutting edge of material science that will allow us to dramatically take some of the, the met metal products out of our um, packaging. Um, all this aimed at the future. The problem, of course, is that uh, this needs to be happening even in faster time. The reality for some of this is that um, we suspect that with the current oil crisis, which even though the prices have collapsed a bit now, long term we believe that there are inherent drivers um, on both commodities and oil prices. I suspect that 15, 20 years from now, maybe less, um, the notion of being able to go into a supermarket and buy food that is um, from a season um, around the world um, will probably have disappeared or the pricing will be so exorbitant it will be priced according to the true costs of transporting that food. Similarly, we think that the kind of packaging you're seeing today in the shiny bags will probably have disappeared and we'll be thinking about very different types of packaging. To do this, you need to have an infrastructure and we already have these uh, centers of excellence around the world. Um, obviously a number in the US, uh, quite a strong center in Mexico. The UK, a, a new center just opened outside of Leicester. And in Russia, where we've just acquired the largest fruit juice company in Europe. Um, in India, a large group, and in Shanghai. Um, you're likely to see others happen in Dubai. And basically, people say, if you're not in <coughs> Shanghai, Dubai, or Mumbai, it's goodbye. Um, and that is really telling you something that, while the US remains obviously critically important, Everything to the east of the Middle East is where the future growth of the world is going to come from in terms of the world economy and the world demand and so on. And that is how we're likely to be gearing up 
It requires a cultural shift in the way we think about the future, the people we work with, the kind of products we develop, and also bringing in the scientists uh, that we need to work with. I mentioned before that we are increasingly engaging with outsiders, and um, one of my tasks was to say to, col to colleagues internally, what's the benefit of engaging um, with people? Um, and we think there are many reasons. If you actually engage, you can find solutions that may not require regulation. You can reduce unexpected shocks. You can actually improve the knowledge of uh, leaders in science about what we're doing. We can actually stimulate our own colleagues' engagement in our health journey. And I mention this because many of you are anticipating a career in industry, for example, and I'm sure there are a number of you, will be judging a company not just by the wage package that you're going to get, but the values and the content of the work. And the more we change those, the more we find we become more attractive as a company. There's a massive talent scarcity in the world, um, maybe as not high, as high in the US as it is in China and India and in our future growth markets. And this is being able to engage is perhaps one of our most important competitive edge of driving people into the company. Um, and, but there are risks. And the kind of thing I'm doing here is, is a risk, uh, going out to a group of students and having a chat and hoping that I'm going to get some pretty tough questions. The risk I summarize is in terms of the tortoise potential. And being from South Africa, you wouldn't know what this is. Basically, a tortoise, as you know, makes progress only when it sticks its neck out. And then it's vulnerable to being, having its neck chopped off. And that's a risk we face every time we go in to engage in an outside audience. And that's the reason why I suspect many of my colleagues have been fearful about engaging either with academics or with NGOs in some of these debates. So we have to show what are the gains of actually talking to people. And here's just a, a simple list of a couple of areas where we're active, uh, showing some of the specific progress. Um, marketing to kids, there's a continued great push that we actually clean up our marketing act in terms of children. We now have an agreement through the International Beverage Association that as of the end of January, we'll no longer be marketing beverage products to children under 12 worldwide. Um, we would hope to extend that to foods and make an announcement about that within the next few months. How do you know that we're doing this? Well, we believe that there should be independent verification, not by ourselves, but an independent audit company. Um, in terms of schools, probably the best example we have is the Alliance for Healthier Generation, where in the US setting, um, over the last two years, 60% less calories have been shipped into the school system of 135,000 schools under an agreement with the Clinton Foundation, the American Heart Association, um, and a range of others. Um, in terms of the workplace, um, I chair the, the World Economic Forum's Workplace Wellness Initiative for the industry, which is a joint initiative with the World Health Organization, <coughs> trying to make sure that we walk the talk, that we actually change our internal processes in the workplace to make uh, healthy eating and living <coughs> better. Product reformulation, I won't go through all of this, but just to say the, in the area of trans fats, um, the Pan American Health Organization, which is the regional office for WHO in the Americas, has held a series of meetings which we've participated in, which led to a call for companies to pledge to make sure they are trans fat free across the Americas by the end of the year. And well, obviously we've signed on as of most companies. That the problem th that we realized in the discussion was that it's fine for big multinationals to, to sign on because we can do it, we can carry the costs. The problem is, what do you do about the smaller uh, companies who don't have the capital capability to do it and will be at a competitive disadvantage in their own countries? Um, they've been forced to the table to do it generally. And I raise that as an area of general interest that when, if, when you think of the food industry, you think of food quality and you think of saturated fats and so on, you need to think as well about the non-multinational companies who often are the laggards of the industry in each of the countries. How do we bring them on board? It's not that easy because they don't have the financial capability to do a lot of what we can do. Physical activity, of course, we have a wide right range of activities. And we, we recognize that every time we talk about physical activity, even though we believe in the centrality of energy balance, your first reaction is going to be one that this is a self-serving interest, that we try to divert attention away from the main topic, which is calories in. And that's why we put it down here, not at the top, that we're doing all of this stuff 
but we also need to do a greater amount of effort to change the physical activity environment. And as you know, in the US, only one state has mandatory physical education in the school system, which I think is more than a scandal. Um, our work on undernutrition is gaining strength, and the, one of the major groups we work with is the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, which is a um, Gates and Norwegian government supported group who focus on micronutrient deficiencies. And they are starting to help us, and I'll give you the last thing uh, mention about it. And finally, I would say one of the challenges we face worldwide is that there's been a serious underinvestment in nutrition science and in food science, um, which is so severe that in some parts of the world, you simply cannot find the nutrition and food scientists you need, both for ourselves or for government. And the result, I believe, is often that you have anecdotal approaches to health policy, not based upon understanding the consequences or the untoward effects of some of the approaches being developed. Our most important interaction at the global level is with the World Health Organization. And I was very pleased to see that we were able to get eight CEOs, um, General Mills should be here, <coughs> to sign on to a letter to Margaret Chan, the Director General, spelling out a series of commitments about what we as companies will do over the next few years to support the global strategy on diet and physical activity. Each one of these is now being translated into detailed specifics in collaboration with WHO, uh, starting with the marketing one, where there'll be a meeting in November. Um, but also in embedded in these is an explicit focus on salt, trans fats, um, and probably in time sugar as well, um, a range of issues related to, to labeling. I put this up because in my 10 years at the World Health Organization, I would have loved to have seen companies make this kind of commitment in the pharmaceutical industry at a time when we were facing massive problems on access to pharmaceutical drugs in the area of AIDS or neglected tropical diseases. We never got it because the industry itself could never agree. And second, they wouldn't want to put something in writing. So you need to read this as being quite an important landmark decision and one which you, sitting outside industry, should be monitoring and calling to account, asking the question, we've made these commitments now. Are we implementing them? If so, why not? And we recognize we're now facing a new set of challenges. Having made the commitments public, we now have to put in place the means to actually get behind every one. Our failure to implement these will actually set us back significantly from the path of talking about engagement over the next few years. And I think that sort of pressure is pretty good to have on companies. Some of us will make it, others will not. Just to say, how does this come together internally? How do we resolve tensions that exist between marketing, wanting to market everything to everyone, everywhere, every time, every place, which is their job, and us on the health and nutrition side saying there have to be restraints, we need to look at responsible <coughs> marketing, and so on. Um, and I chair a thing called the Global Human Sustainability Task Force, where we have the marketing people, communications, legal, and so on. So it gives you a sense of how do we starting to get organized internally to have what are often pretty tough discussions, the kind of discussion that I think you'd be surprised to sit in on um, when it's a question of immediate profits versus long-term health consequences, and how do you make those trade-offs so that the public health benefit actually comes to the fore. Generally, um, I can't say that in our company we actually have uh, any level of hostility. It's always a question of timing rather than a question of the intent to do the right thing. The intent is always there. The question of when and how you do it usually is what we debate. Um, in coming towards the end, um, our, our fearless CEO, uh, Indra Nui, who uh, is on the Yale Corporation and um, very much uh, believes in the future of business from a different perspective, um, went and made a commitment to the Prime Minister of um, the UK um, at the end of last year um, in a private meeting. And basically said, um, he said to her, you know, you need to do more about undernutrition in the world. And um, she gave a response and said yes and said what we were going to do. At the back of the room was a colleague of mine from the development agency for the British government who immediately sent me an email saying, this is fantastic news. Uh, what, you actually, what are the details of what you're going to do? And of course, it was the first I heard of it. Um, but once the CEO has said it, 
probably of any company, its policy. And it's now up to us inside the company to make it happen. And of course, for many of us, this was a, a wonderful opportunity to say, well, how do you harness the capabilities of a company to address a Millennium Development Goal that is so lagging, Millennium Development Goal number one? And so we have a team now in place starting to address this in a substantive way. I'm not going to uh, go through that. But let me just uh, get to, uh, let me just get before ending. I'd, let me just jump down to the nutrition science issue. One of the things I mentioned earlier was the fact that we do face a problem in terms of the quality of nutrition science. And how do you quantify this? What we did was we went to colleagues at uh, Liverpool University who um, have one of the best uh, library searching capabilities and they do these massive searches, where we asked the question, what have been the publication output of the top 10 medical and nutrition journals of the world over the last 15 years? And what is the origin by country of the first <coughs> author of those publications <coughs> over the last 15 years? Have there been any trends? And, and this is just a snapshot of the data for the last two years. Basically, it tells two interesting stories. First of all, if you categorize the articles over the last two years, 83% deal with overweight and obesity and 4% under nutrition, micronutrients somewhere in between. Now remember the figures I showed you earlier, about a billion um, overweight um, or obese, and almost a billion um, undernourished. So clearly there's, there's quite a discrepancy in terms of the content of where nutrition researchers are placing their energy. Second, if you look at the site, by far the majority is in the US, and if I added in the UK um, and Canada, Australia, you'd probably get this figure would probably go up to 70, 75%. If you take the total output of India and China, which accounts for 40% of the world's population, it accounts for less than 5% of the publications. Now you can say these are the more elite journals, that's true. But if you do the same uh, studies in other areas of public health, whether it's in AIDS or in cardiovascular disease and so on, you see a slightly better distribution um, suggesting a higher proportion of scientific activity in these two countries. And of course, um, if I was to add in Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, we're talking about a publication output that is within rounding error. It's almost imperceptible that it's so small. <coughs> so when we stand back, we say, well, you know, the problem of this, the problem with this data for us as a company is that the scientists we need are not being produced. And the attitudes, the partners we need in, in, in government or in NGOs or academia are simply not getting modern concepts of nutrition science. And we've tried to build the case inside our foundation to say that what the company and the foundation needs to do is to join forces with many of the other development agencies <coughs> and say, well, we need to have a major push to strengthen nutrition science worldwide, particularly in the countries where we're going to need it over the next few years. So our vision is that um, the American Journal of Public Health, and this is the, um, if you look carefully, this is the August 2015 edition, and uh, this would be the, the the headline on that, PepsiCo's performance demonstrates companies can deliver great taste and provide beneficial nutrition that improves the consumer's health. Our aspiration is that the American Journal of Public Health would carry this special edition, and not only that one, but the New York Times, also in, on August the 8th, 2015, would be carrying an article uh, describing how we've actually started meeting the nutritional needs of vulnerable populations uh, through our R&D and joint efforts. I'd be keen to have discussions to see how realistic it is that we're going to get there and obviously to hear any of your concerns and questions. Thank you very much. So in um, wanting to expose you folks to a perspective from the food industry, a lot of people from a lot of different parties could have been invited. Um, as I've talked about the food industry, it goes all the way from large businesses to small business to the agribusiness companies like Monsanto and Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland to the people who sell a lot of food, Walmart being at the leading, the leader of that list, to the people who manufacture food uh, products like PepsiCo. So why PepsiCo and why Derek? Well, why Derek is pretty obvious from what he just said. He has a unique perspective on this because of his background in public health 
and the fact that uh, he now is working in the business setting. But why PepsiCo? Well, PepsiCo, of all the players that I know of, is probably the most progressive, at least one of the most progressive food companies. And the progressiveness comes from the very top. Uh, Derek mentioned the current CEO of PepsiCo, Indra Nui, uh, who's well connected with Yale, as Derek mentioned, um, but has been very committed to this. And the CEO that preceded her, Steve Reinemann, very committed as well to health and wellness as part of a business model as well as almost a moral commitment. And so if one looks to the industry for the most progressive players, I believe PepsiCo is at the head of the list and, and hence why I invited Derek. So we have plenty of time for questions now and I welcome you to ask him any questions you like. And uh, as you can see from his comments, he's, he's ready for it all. <laughs> That's good. Yes, please. Um, I was wondering what uh, drove your decision to switch over from working for the WHO to working for PepsiCo. Do you think this had a bigger impact on your work than in your decision? You know, um, when I first. Yeah, the, the, sorry, the question was what drove me to move from WHO or the public sector to PepsiCo, and did I believe it had a big impact? Um, I mean, a couple of answers. First, I mean, during the process, it was. It was not uh, something I thought or even thought about. Sought. Um, I was uh, at the Rockefeller Foundation, um, heading global health, um, when I got a call from the CEO's office about a month before she assumed office, um, saying she wanted to have some different types of perspectives in the company as she took over. And her vision, as Kelly said, was a very different vision from where we are necessarily today. Um, and it was really that vision of where we want to go. I, I've always been driven by working with people with very powerful visions. At WHO, I had another extraordinary uh, woman uh, who drove, our, drove WHO, a girl, Holland Brundtland, um, who also, I think, inspired. And there's nothing like working inside an inspiring company. Um, when I was at WHO, um, I, I worked on the global strategy. And one of the pieces of work I had to do at the time was to try and define the role of the private sector. And it was the first time ever that we had actually spoken to food companies in WHO to try and understand what they thought they could do before we wrote down what we thought they should do. And I remember preparing this list. And um, I, I use that list still as, as my mandate for what I'm doing inside a food company. And it's not particularly different from the mandate that we gave to food companies when I was at WHO limit salt, fat, and sugar, uh, improve the focus on nutritious products, change your marketing, change your labeling, address the school's policies, and so on. But the move wasn't easy. I mean, to say it was easy would, would also be wrong. The first person I phoned after my wife had actually was pretty supportive, but I phoned my, my mother in Cape Town. And I said to her, you know, I'm going to be making another move. And she gets a bit sick of these moves because it's difficult for her to remember and tell all her friends, you know, he's not doing some, doesn't know what I'm doing ever. But <laughs> and she said to me, you do realize that they make these terrible sodas and chips. <laughs> and they own Simba in South Africa, which is the largest snack producer. And um, it's always a good test to see, well, how can I convince her that I can make a difference? And it took six months before I could actually have a meeting a dinner at her house where I invited my PepsiCo people to actually come down and talk about what we're going to do. Um, I wouldn't say she's 100% convinced yet, but she understands the journey that we're on. And I think that's what I also expect others to appreciate at this point. At this moment, we're in the point of, I would have people suspend their judgment with a little bit of um, skepticism, as we do, I might say, because it's a journey that may not succeed. We hope it is going to succeed. The core of what will make it succeed is whether we can transform the business model while we are transforming the product portfolio. And that is never an easy thing to do. We know consumer demand in the US is very high for the healthier side of our portfolio. But consumer demand for the healthier part of the portfolio in other parts of the world is much more complex both to assess and to address. So in answer to your question, yes, I did think I could have a, a bigger impact um, using the experience, but I would say that um, I, really, I, I really see myself as um, maintaining the same goals and objectives that I had at WHO and trying to see how you're able to lever the partnerships that exist out there 
to achieve those goals. There's no way PepsiCo is going to do any of this alone. It's going to require very strong academic and intellectual support on the science. It's going to need deeper and different types of interactions with NGOs. Uh, it's going to have more complex partnerships with many business entities that we've never worked with in the past. And all of that I see as, as a, a wonderful challenge. Yes, at the back. Um, the question was, um, what about portion size and how can we justify 32 ounce things? And Kelly, I'm sure, has shown you these uh, gulps and super gulp things. That's, it's a critical question. And I, <coughs> I just glossed over, uh, over one of the points I should have made. I think that there are two very different, that there are two independent issues that need to be addressed in addressing obesity through product design. The one is the energy density of the products and the second is portion size. And we know from work from Barbara Rolls and many others that they actually operate independently. And if you do the one without the other, you're in trouble. Because we may very well bring down energy density and then have these huge packs. People <laughs> simply consume more and you'll be back to the same, the calorie position. Even though there may be healthier calories, the total volume may be wrong. So we have got a concerted effort to include portion size as an explicit focus of our work, both through a joint initiative with a range of other companies in the US, which hopefully we'll make public before probably somewhere next year. But, and the good news about it, and I, let me just give you the kind of thinking that we have. First of all, I think that what portion size does, uh, what nutrient profiling generally does, um, is it actually doesn't have, an, when you have labels on packs, my own view, which is a, a personal and not a corporate view, is that the best benefit of having uh, calorie labeling on every single pack which is the route we're heading towards, uh, isn't that it's going to make a big difference on consumer behavior as much on corporate behavior. No company wants big numbers on their packs. So what they're going to do, they're going to do what you're starting to see, 100 calorie packs becoming the norm in terms of cereals and snacks and bars and things. Uh, the beverage size, shrinking the size of the beverages. And we have raised the question about why can't we jack up our R&D to make sure that in any multi-serve pack, there are actual divisions in the pack that uh, change the default option that you've got to actively make a decision to go on to portion two or serving two rather than simply have the ability to pour and eat and eat and eat and eat. That discussion has started and as I said, I'm quite impressed if you go to the shelves to see how the 100 calorie notion seems to have taken off. And in the research that we've certainly done, people are not overcompensating. The good news is that they seem to be reducing total calorie intake by having those 100 calorie packs. But the even better news to justify it in the company is that the cost, the, the, the profit to the company is slightly higher on a 100 calorie pack than it would be on a very large pack, meaning that it's good for business and for public health. And the more we can push to understand innovative ways of doing portion control, I think the better we'll be off in terms of both the obesity epidemic as well as um, some of the longer term issues. There is a downside, and the downside um, comes from the environmental consequences of packaging, as you tend to have more packaging. And that's going to be a debate that we also need to address. Um, at the back there, and then there. Me? Yeah. The question was, maybe I, I won't let you know what the question was. No, well the, <laughs> the question was, um, what about the, uh, the fruits and vegetables? Um, and we're a processed food company. And second of all, how do you combine uh, the tomatoes and olive oil and products? Well, I think on the first, we've, we've got to be honest about what we are and what we are not. 
we are, we, we are not a fresh fruit uh, producer, and so we, we must be quite honest about that. Um, we can get close in terms of our juices. We can do a lot better with both fruit and vegetable juices. And we can also get closer in terms of using fruit and vegetable products and turning them into uh, easy to use convenient products. So Unilever has pushed the boundary on this in terms of bird's eye and many of their um, easy to microwave steam and use uh, frozen uh, fr uh, vegetables. It's certainly our view that the majority of people uh, in particularly inner cities um, are going to struggle to be able to uh, f meet their fruit and vegetable demand by having um, th the natural full product as their sole means of meeting that demand and that there will be a need for some degree of processed fruit and vegetables uh, to meet the, le the, the gap. And we're talking about a very big gap. Um, the, the, the WHO guidelines of about four to 500 grams a day are not being met in almost any country in the world except maybe Spain and some of the Mediterranean countries. On the second of um, tomatoes and, and olive oil, there are a wide range of products, um, whether they are dips, which we, you know, we do quite a lot of uh, dips now, um, or whether they are even in terms of, um, we have uh, um, some of our, our newer chips and uh, food products coming out, even in terms of some of the drinks that you're going to see, beverages, there are ways to combine olive oil and, and tomato. Um, next year you should invite Ipan George, originally from India, who sits on this and, um, and he's able to give a much more passionate description of the work that he's uh, plotting and planning. And is in pilot uh, 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 tasting uh, in, in India and other parts of the developing world. Yeah, down here somewhere. The coalition amongst the eight food producers, that was really noble. But I have one question. How much policy change can you affect through the food service industry itself and how the food supply actually reaches the consumers, like changing McDonald's cup sizes versus changing uh, burger sizes? Yeah, the question is, what about the food service industry? And, and that is an incredibly important area. Um, I mean, the food service area industry, you've got to realize, our, I mean, I'm sure you do realize, our, our, our customers. Um, and most big food companies would have a, a structured relationship with them. Obviously, Coke and McDonald's, ourselves, and a whole range of others. Um, they also recognize that they face the same kind of critique that um, we are all facing and they need to move. Um, in the US, we are likely to see them come into this coalition and I suspect within the next few months we'll see certainly McDonald's and some of the bigger ones, uh, Yum Foods, um, entering into the global coalition. <coughs> um, if I was to just tell you how tough it is to get eight CEOs to agree to start with, uh, it was unbelievable work. Every little word gets lawyered and checked. Um, getting in the food service first, we thought was going to simply be too tough. But now that we're out there, the food service companies are saying, well, what about us? Uh, why aren't you talking to us? There have been some food service companies who have, until very recently, had a position that makes it impossible for us to talk to them. And that was their position on calorie transparency. Um, our CEO has gone out front saying, if you're going to get on top of the issue of obesity, you cannot do it without being completely transparent about calories on your packaging, on your menus, on every possible way, and having an educational program to let people know what that means. Well, as you probably know, there have been some in the food service industry who continue or have challenged the New York restaurant ban, the, rest on, you know, the demand on, on calories. That, that resistance we are, is either completely gone or it's almost going to have gone, which will open the door to us being able to talk. Um, somewhere at the back again and then down here. Okay, well let's take, yeah. You mentioned that you're uh, working to get uh, research and development to do, uh, bring about uh, healthier food. What are some of the actual products that uh, PepsiCo has introduced that are healthier in the U.S. and what are some products that they have done globally and what, and what differs uh, in the healthier products being produced in the U.S. and around the world? Well, I think if you start off by saying, what have we done to the core of some of the classic products? Let's take the UK, for example. Um, there's been a 30 to 40 percent reduction in saturated fat and a 30 percent reduction in salt or sodium um, in the Walker's Crisp brand. Now, 
the, the Brits are completely fanatical about their chips, and they have been for a century. Um, and that translates into a measurable difference uh, in terms of blood pressure, the salt levels in the UK. Um, I could go through a wide range of, of pro in, the, in, the same, in the same vein. In terms of new products, I think on, on acquisitions, one of the most important acquisitions I hinted at was the acquisition of a very large fruit and vegetable company, Lubedletsky, out of Russia, which is going to give us the ability um, to have a fruit and vegetable platform that we never had in Eastern Europe and Russia. Remember that um, there is a massive cardiovascular disease problem in Eastern Central Europe and Russia, and in fact, death rates continue to rise <coughs> among men rather than go down because of their nutrient profile. We think that we're well placed to start doing it. In terms of specific brands, um, they tend to be small at this stage. So you've seen in the US new brands coming on like Naked um, with a fairly good profile, um, Stacy's, which is a baked, uh, uh, baked product, um, and I could give you a range of, of others as well. They tend to be smaller. They're not going to be $500 million brands. You must remember on that list, there, there are something like 17 brands uh, in the portfolio which have over a billion dollars in sale worldwide. The problem that a company like PepsiCo has is how does it introduce a new, relatively small, highly healthy, innovative product and give it a chance to survive before they kill it off? We have had some healthy brands. Uh, there was one, um, I think, called Philosophy, which you may have seen around, which was a beverage with quite an interesting portfolio, good protein, whatever, which got killed off because it simply wasn't meeting its big figure target uh, in time, and they simply weren't going to put the, the marketing dollars behind it. That's why I say that while many of you will focus on the nutrient profile, I hope that there are folk here who will be taking the business uh, science route because the biggest challenge I think we face is to think about a business model that works more effectively for healthy foods, R&D, research, and delivery. Yes, please. Yeah, there is actually a report out by Consumers International. It came out yesterday. If you go to the website, you'll see it. It's called something like a serial culprit or something. It's a clever word on cereals. And basically <coughs> makes the point about um, two other companies, uh, not ours, um, making the point that um, often the, uh, the salt levels are higher than seawater and the sugar levels are higher than soda in a number of the cereals. And that's probably true. Um, for Quaker, which is our brand, our main cereal brand, um, we, are, we have got and we are setting even tighter uh, profiles around what is acceptable in terms of sugar and salt, and they will become the norm internationally. Um, and they are within what we regard as the close to the dietary guidelines. It's a very good point because, um, <coughs> I mean, I, for, many, for, for many people, hopefully breakfast is an important meal, and particularly for children. And I think we've grown up in a culture of um, increasing adding the sugar and adding the salt. Um, you know, I think if any of you, I'm sure you've probably read the book The End of Food by Tom Roberts. Um, hopefully, um, if Kelly hasn't made it required reading, after reading his book, of course, um, I would recommend that it should be required reading. <coughs> but it's, if when you read the book, you get a sense of how the salt and the sugar got in there in the first place into many of the products, and how the food conglomerates got to where they are today. And when I stood back and, and, and thought about the book, what struck me was that there were small decisions made all the way along the line, over 50 years. We've been making these decisions without having a broad strategic framework within which to make them, and not thinking about the untoward effects. And it hasn't been necessarily malintent. Certainly there may have been a marketer who said, we increase sugar, we'll probably make the sweetness will go up, kids will probably like it, let's we'll be able to sell more. Who knows whether that was the case. But getting out of that now and reversing it requires <coughs> us to think a lot more strategically, not just about um, taking the salt down or the sugar down, but how you do it in a way in which you don't switch consumers who now like the sugar into an even more unhealthy category 
to actually go and compensate for sugar or for salt. And that's the big fear. The example I use is um, what happened on saturated fats in the 70s, when we all said we've got to lower saturated fats because of the, co the cholesterol and the cardiovascular consequences. How did industry respond? Well, I think two untoward effects happened. First, to maintain taste, they pushed up the sugar levels in yogurts and dairy products. And at the time, the, the uh, public health folk never said anything that that was something they shouldn't do. But they just did it because they saw they, they maintain their consumer base. And the second was the drive towards hydrogenated oils and then the start of the trans fat scare. That was the other way you did it. And so they created two new problems, sugar in dairy products and trans fats in a wide range of products off what was originally a base of trying to lower saturated fats. Now when we look at how we're going to lower sugar supply or salt in the, in the food supply, we need to be much wiser and have a wider group of people from academia, research and whatever, think carefully not about just the direct effect of lowering it in one category, but the effect across the food system and across food preferences. Yeah, one more. Yes, at the back there. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, redirecting your influence on, in school um, by, I think it was, physical, by, in, by promoting physical activity and education. What specific methods would educators use? Well, I think in schools there actually are um, four, four key things that, w that we need to do. The first two, which are partly under our control, are marketing to kids um, and trying to move towards a market-free school environment. Second, the, the, the content of food that's available through the food services and the vending machines, and that's what some of the progress in the US has been achieved on. The two which are less directly under our influence, nutrition education and physical activity, we believe, first of all, we have a powerful advocacy role with the rest of civil society to demand that government do what government doesn't do, and that's invest properly in physical education programs and quality education around nutrition in schools. We think we can play a role, not necessarily through the corporation, because the fear of doing it through the corporation is that you then are, are accused of putting your branding out and trying to get involved in public policy issues. But certainly through the philanthropic arm of your foundation, supporting groups who might want to go and test and develop innovative school programs. So the one which our foundation has supported in the US has been Somerville uh, through Tufts. Uh, Somerville is one of the well-evaluated school programs. It includes all of those components, and we believe it's starting to show an effect. Similarly, there, there are other school-based programs starting to show an effect. So I would draw the distinction between what we need to do in terms of our mainline core business. We have the capability to address marketing and the products in schools. We should be doing more on that. But we need to do, in partnership, the education and activity components.